All right. What we got here is a. We're going to start out some uh, stuff here with our uh, climate control and everybody's. Some of the some of the been doing some of your computer stuff and you kind of got in uh, a little bit of shoe in on that kind of thing. So uh, there's two principles we're going to talk about. Make sure you get those those things signed and, and back to me now. With all deals, but um. What we're going to do, uh, and uh, Reeves is in a slightly different class, but this is not going to hurt him a bit. So, how many of you guys have ever heard of the latent heat of vaporization? Have y'all seen that over there? All this stuff you've been doing? The latent heat of vaporization? And the latent heat of condensation? Have you ever heard of any of that stuff? If I put, if I put a, a boiler of water on the stove, and that boiler of water, I started, I start heating it up. Like I just go over here, let's say I had a stove in here, and I had a piece of, I mean a thermometer sticking in that water, and I started heating that water up, how hot could I get that water? And that would be? 350 degrees. No, it ain't 350 degrees, come on. It's 212, 212 or 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so if I kept on applying heat, what would happen? The water would evaporate and turn into what? Steam, okay, the, the temperature of the steam is going to be the same as the temperature of the water. And so basically, the water is actually continuing to absorb heat while changing states. So as it evaporates, it's absorbing heat. Now, I could take, and I'm not going to do this, but I could take refrigerant, a can of refrigerant, and you know, so that I could squirt, and I could squirt it in a styrofoam cup, right, like a coffee cup, and in that styrofoam cup, I could actually catch probably that much refrigerant in that styrofoam cup with it just open to the atmosphere because the uh, properties of styrofoam are such that it'll do that. And within a styrofoam cup, you, it, you could put that thing on a table and lay a piece of paper over it and it would probably stay there three or four hours. Now, don't ever do this because if somebody comes by and spills it on their self or drinks some of it, it's over. You know what I'm saying? So you don't want to go there. And while I'm talking, and this is a slight safety concern, don't ever take some fluid, brake fluid or anything like that, and put it in a bottle, of, a Gatorade bottle, especially not if somebody is drinking Gatorade close by, because they may pick up the bottle and drink oil or something. This has happened in some shops I've known about. And uh, these guys from the EPA were in California at a shop that belongs to a friend of mine out there. And they had a Dr. Pepper bottle or a Sprite bottle or something that they had put some brake fluid or something in. And this mechanic reached over here and thought he was grabbing his drink and drank a bunch of that stuff. And he sued the EPA because <laughs> it was EPA guy that left it sitting there. You know, I mean, and he had to get his stomach pumped and all this kind of stuff. But the simple fact is, uh, don't put bleach or something else in a water bottle and set it where somebody might drink it, okay? It's not smart to do that. Anyway. So basically, if you've got refrigerant in this styrofoam cup, okay, what's going to happen to that refrigerant if I pour it on the table? It's going to boil. Just like you poured water on a hot, you know, griddle. It's going to go and it's going to leave a, a spot of frost there. Uh, but, I mean, you can actually do this with a, uh, a can, one of them uh, uh, canned air cans. You know, that's, you can do that same thing with that stuff. It's a refrigerant. You know how the cold it can get when you're using it a lot? Same deal. All right, so as the as it evaporates, it's absorbing heat. That's the point. And that's what leaves a spot of ice there. Um, so what is the uh, boiling point, more or less, of refrigerant? Anybody know? 21 degrees below zero. The refrigerant typically boils, you know, about 20 degrees below zero. Okay, as... It turns from a liquid into a gas, it's absorbing heat. That's why, uh, how about when you get out of the shower, particularly on a day like today, you're kind of wanting a heater running in the bathroom because as you're, or I'm out of the pool on a cool day, whenever the water is evaporating off your skin, it's carrying heat away. That's what climate, you know, that's how you do that. And they basically, basically uh, made that happen with climate control in a controlled way. Okay, so as water is turning from a liquid, uh, from a gas back into a liquid, what's it doing? Condensing. Huh? Condensing. Condensing, but what, what's going on with the, the heat part of it? Temperature change. 
temperature change being from um, hot cold. You're actually the the refrigerant is absorbing. I mean, it's giving off heat. So heat's basically what you're moving from one place to the other, right? You're you're absorbing heat in there in the evaporator. You're carrying it out of the condenser, and you're getting rid of it out there, and then you're cycling it back through. And whenever it goes, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, you got your heater system. We're going to start on that. Talking about this, and uh, we've gone on here before. All right. So let me ask you this: If you got a heater core here in the dash, we used to have uh, for sometimes. You know, we would have noisy. Uh, so the noise can be generated by this water flowing through the heater core. And on some of the Tauruses that they made back in the mid '90s. Uh, the water going through the heater core was a problem. And so what they did was they had us put a uh, little restrictor in one of the heater hoses. Now, so you got two heater hoses going to the average heater core, right? Unless it's a Jaguar and then it's got more. But the simple fact is you got two heater hoses going there. One of them is either bigger than the other one. A lot of times if you get a heater core out of the box, and this is important, so listen to what I'm telling you. I'm not just, I'm not just killing time. And I try to keep your eyes off your phone and be keep looking at me. But on these little uh, aluminum pipes that go into these heater cores, there's going to be times when you're going to look into that uh, aluminum pipe and you're going to see a restrictor in there. If you look down in there with a flashlight, you'll see that they've put a, what looks like a thick washer in there that has choked down the coolant so that it can't travel through there. Now, what do you suppose is going to happen you know, as soon as you crank up the car, before the thermostat opens or anything else, where's the first place the water pump starts shoving that coolant? Okay. Through the dadgum heater core. It goes straight to the heater core. All right. What if somebody has, for some reason or another, let's say both of these tubes are the same size. You know, a lot of them have got a bigger hose and a littler hose. The one coming from the engine is always supposed to be the little one. The one going back to the engine is supposed to be the big one. Likewise, the one coming from the engine is supposed to be the one with the little... Uh, orifice in it and the one coming out is supposed to not have an orifice but what do you suppose would happen if both of these were the same size and you hooked them up backwards bust the dead gum heater core pressure building a heater core next thing you know you got a leaking heater core and how many of you guys have replaced a heater core no fun right I mean dash comes off all the air I mean all that jays it's a big job well, most cars. Now, some cars it's fairly easy uh, and all that, some, some of the older pickup stuff. But the simple fact is, be really particular about which way that coolant's going. Now, what if you don't know which way it's going? Because of the plumbing, sometimes it's hard to tell. Now, this is really important. You get me? All right, what I like to do, and if I'm going to find out whether or not a heater's working or not, and I'm giving you some advanced stuff right to begin with, and some of you may have even seen us do this here, girl comes in and she says, my car doesn't have any heat. And so what I did was we, you know, make sure it's full of coolant first, because if it's low on coolant, you're not going to have any heat. First thing we did, we unplugged the heater hoses. And we took a clear hose, you know, like you buy from Ace Hardware or something, and just loop out the heater core so you can see. And you crank it up and see if coolant goes screaming through there, because it got to go whipping through there really fast, because the water pumps will be pushing it. Wasn't hardly anything coming out there, just really weak. And right over there, and you'll see one of those water pumps over there, it's got an impeller that's rusted almost completely away. That's the water pump that was on that car. It was a like a 96 Taurus or something. And it had, had you know, you were telling me that one of them that you took off last week over there was rusted out like that. Uh, they like paper thin. Yeah, paper thin rusted away. Also, if those impeller blades rust away to where they're too far from that reaction surface, or if something else has removed part of the reaction surface, then if there's too much space in there, the water pump's not going to move the water either. See what I mean? So that's really an important relationship between the impeller and the reaction surface. And I've seen, I, there's other stories I can tell you about that, but I'm just going to go slow. I'm going to say, make darn sure that you know when you're hooking these hoses back up that A, there's not an orifice in one of those, and B, if they're one bigger than the other one, or if it's you know, it's easier to make the mistake if you're looking at both of them being the same size of an orifice in one. But some guy would kept coming back with his heater core leaking over and over again on a car, and it turned out the guy at the Ford place, when he put this uh, recall thing in there with the, uh, with the restrictor, he put it in the wrong hose. 
and it was pressuring up the heater core and it kept busting the heater core. See what I mean? So if you have to replace a heater core several times in a row, <laughs> you'll learn. But I mean, I'm just trying to, to shield you from that, so don't go there, right? Uh, so basically your water pump is going to go straight from the water pump through the heater core and it's going back into the engine. Some of the GM parts look like it's radiator and all that kind of stuff. Right. socket that fell off of something else. Oh, happened. somebody. Did you, did you did let this fall off that car up there? I think it was a All right. So, all right. So now then, the heater system uses hot engine coolant. This ain't rocket science to heat the passenger compartment and that's why there's no heat until the engine warms up. Now the stuff I'm telling you about this this service-based stuff you're not going to get from your computer stuff, but the computer stuff is really a good launching uh, pad for, you know, theory and a basic understanding. Uh, you got a heater core, you got a bore motor, you got a heater control panel, you got air inlet direction doors, instrument panel ducts and outlets. These doors in the dash have got to move around and uh, go up, go out. All right. Now, typically, whenever you've got some kind of a failure in for years, whenever, like if you lost the vacuum that was going to the AC system, it would blow to the defrost. Anybody know why it done that? I hope that's the most important Yes, exactly. Now, you want it to be able to clear your glass. Uh, you know, if you, how many of you guys have ever been driving something old that the air conditioner didn't work on, and when you turned on the heater, it fogged up the glass worse? <laughs> I figured you'd raise your hand. But I mean, that, that's what you don't want. You don't want it to fog the glass up where you can't see anything, right? All right, so this is what the heater core looks like. You might notice both one of those pipes is bigger than the other one. That one, is, it's hard to make the mistake on that one of hooking the hoses up backwards. Uh, but basically, what you're not wanting to do is hook them up so that the coolant's being pumped in there and out here because it will swell up and it'll bust that core. That core can't handle a whole lot of pressure. I mean, not, you know. Uh, but it flows through the heater core and it's usually situated. Most of them nowadays are aluminum, that's an older one. And usually behind the center console or somewhere in there. Looks like a little radiator and it does the same thing. This is a heat exchanger and they've there's got a matrix of tube and air passage in blown into the passenger compartment by the blower motor. Now right here is a neat little thing. you got all these doors in here. See all these doors? Each one of these is a different door. Alright, so you got your blower motor and this is sort of an interesting thing right here. So. Uh, you got, uh, it can either pull it from outside or inside the vehicle, right? If it's pulling it from inside the vehicle, what uh, setting are you on? Recirculate. Yeah, recirculate. What if you don't have recirculate? I don't see recirculate anywhere right here. Where would I put it if I was going to have it, if I wanted to pull it out of the inside of the car and re-air condition? Side. Huh? On the other side. Max. We're going to put it on max. Max is going to do that. Anywhere else you put it, if you just put it on AC or panel, or anything like that, you're going to wind up with it pulling air from the outside. You know, this is a cool thing. Whenever we used to work, there's all kinds of tricks they come up with, these service engineers. Like if you have a wind noise you're trying to fight with. You know, like if somebody's driving down the road, when you work at a new car dealership, sometimes you'll have to fix a wind noise or something. They're not as prevalent as they used to be, and the sound of these wind noises were horrible. But we were working on a wind noise, what we would do is put it on, not on max, but on one where it's pulling from the outside. And when it's pulling from the outside, what we're going to wind up having is a situation where we're increasing the pressure inside the car. And you, with the windows rolled up and everything, increasing the, the pressure inside the car, you take your cigarette smoke or from your cigarette and you pass it around all of the window. And if it, you come to a place where it blows the smoke away, well, you got the fan on high and the windows up, and you found your place. See what I'm saying? You can also take Dr. Schultz's foot powder and spray it on our closed door and sometimes find it that way. Now, like, one way or another, uh, we got this right here. Uh, this right here is basically going to pull it from either inside or outside. That is your reserve door. Uh, and now, some of these have got a lot more doors in this. So this is just the basic thing. Richard? What? Why wouldn't you just take and set a smoke machine in and let it sit there and run? Yeah, in those days, there was no such thing as a smoke machine. You could do that, but you don't want to dust, you don't want to stink up the seats with all that wet smoke. Because that smoke machine smokes wet. Well, and you it, could put um, baby oil in it. And, uh, well, that's doing the same thing. But yeah. what you can do, you're basically, you can take your smoke machine and run it on the outside, <laughs> too. I don't want to get that sticky, that, that greasy, smoky crap all over the inside of the car, so be careful about that. But right here, you're going to take this, if you flop this down here, if you go this door this way, what happens to this air? This is being air conditioned. This is where the change is taking place from liquid to gas, and it's really cold. The heater core is here. So if you move this down here, this air that's coming through here gets air conditioned. What happens to it while it's being air conditioned? 
What is also going on, that air is being dehumidified. It's dripping out on the ground. You know, your, hey, your evaporator brain drip. It's coming from this thing because it's cold and sweaty like a glass of tea. All right, so you've already dried it out, and then you run it through the heater core. And it goes wherever else you set it, whether it goes to the floor, whether it goes to the register, whether it goes to the defrost. It all depends on how you got all that. Now, these are either driven by vacuum diaphragm or they're either or they're driven by uh, electric things. Now, typically, even on cheap trucks like the little Ranger we got out here, because of the fact that they want you to be able to move the blend door, which is this door right here, and stop it anywhere, they'll have a little blend door actuator that's electronic. Got a little potentiometer built into it, several wires hooked to it. Now, on a lot of the cars, when you change out these things, like on that truck of Tim's, we had to change out one of those little things. You basically, after you change out that little motor, you got to pull the battery cable off, put it back on, crank it up, let this thing wake up, reboot, and it's got to find both ends of that so it'll know where it is. See what I'm saying? So it's not always, sometimes you just pop it on there. Sometimes it's got to be uh, programmed. It's got to know, it's got to figure out where it is. Sometimes you've actually got to do some stuff with a scan tool to reset those door loaders when you put them on there. So be aware of the vehicle you're working on. On those Volkswagens, like the one that Daniel's got, you put the same control head in several different vehicles, but when you put it in the vehicle, you got to go in the scan tool and tell it what it what you put it in, because it's got different jobs to do on a van than it does on a little car like his. Even though it's the same head, you got it. Volkswagen also has register temperature sensors and all that. All right, I'm trying to move on through here. You have fresh air recirculate control. We talked about that. Uh, all climate control air management systems, I say that, that is not totally true because some of them now, if they're electronic, don't do that because they don't have a way to do it. So be, up, be prepared to see one that doesn't do that. Now, this is a strange sort of a thing they used to do back in the late 80s, early 90s. And what they would do, Lincoln started out doing this, they had a little switch right here that until, and it had a temperature sensor in it, the blower was wired through it, so if that coolant was it 130 degrees or warmer, the blower wouldn't even work. So if you have a situation where it ever run into a situation on an older Ford or a Lincoln where the uh, blower won't work on heat, then it's going to be that cold engine lockout right there. And that's how that's wired up right there and all that. And so, I mean, you know, a lot of times you're saying, well, you turn on your, uh, you turn the thing over on warm when it's really cold outside, but you don't turn on the blower yet because you know what's coming out of there is going to be cold. It's going to make things worse for you, right? All right. Now, right here, you got the, the big circle. Now, you guys were looking at this earlier. You two over there. Okay, you got your compressor here. It's got pistons in it. You got a fixed orifice here. It's a real simple diagram. As it comes out of here, what state is this refrigerant in when it comes out of here? Remember this because I'm going to have you go through it. Condensed. It's not condensed yet. It's actually going to be high pressure gas. That's your discharge line. The one that leaves the compressor going to the condenser that's in front of the radiator, that is the discharge line. Okay, the discharge line goes through the condenser. You might notice as you keep going through the condenser, it's condensing and it's giving off heat. You're getting rid of the heat you picked up in the evaporator out here, all right? And then it comes out of here as a high pressure liquid. And usually it's hot. Now the newest air conditioners have got what they call a subcooler. And what a subcooler is, is in addition to, and you'll usually see a subcooler will have the uh, receiver dryer built right on the side of the condenser. All right, and the subcooler basically not only condenses the coolant, I mean the refrigerant, it also cools it off. So after it becomes a liquid, imagine how much better your air conditioner work if what goes over here is not only liquid, but it's also cool liquid. It's going to work that much better, isn't it? So basically you go through this fixed orifice, on the ones that have a fixed orifice, there's another one that's got an expansion valve. Talk about that later. It's a different type of variable orifice. Goes through here, and it comes. What, it, what is it when it passes through the fixed orifice? What state is it in? We're talking about. Liquid. It's a, it's liquid, but it's low pressure liquid. And as it passes through the evaporator, it actually evaporates, and according to the late heat of vaporization, it absorbs heat. And as it absorbs heat, it's continually absorbing heat. Let's say that you're charging up a, an air conditioner and you're not sure how much refrigerant it's supposed to take. I went one time out there when I was writing an article for uh, the Mobile Air Conditioning Society where this guy was putting an AC compressor on a doggone uh, knuckle boom. You know the knuckle boom, the big thing that you know puts, moves metal around out of them finger steel? 
and uh, the, it had lost its refrigerant charges, so we had to put a compressor on it. I was helping him, and I was writing an article about it and all that. I got to, I'll probably give that out as a handout later this time. But how do you tell if you have no idea how much refrigerant to put in it? You can hold the line until it gets cold. Yeah, which line? Uh, <laughs> I think it's a high pressure one. Or that one's going to be hot. Yeah, the uh, low pressure side. Right there, if that line is cold all the way to the air conditioner compressor, then you've got enough. You got me? In other words, you want this, this big suction line that goes into the air conditioner compressor when it gets good and cold. You know, as soon as it gets good and cold, you stop putting refrigerant in it. You know, you don't want to overcharge it because if you overcharge it, it's not going to work right either. And there is a pop-off valve on this sucker. It'll go, you know, it basically is made for safety reasons. Uh, now think about this. They're not going to basically leave this thing where it can just build pressure, build pressure, and build pressure because if it happens to bust the evaporator, it's liable to spray your feet with cold juice, right? All right, now this is the way it looks kind of on the car, right? All right, basically this is, what part is this? Right here. Read the words. There's your condenser. Liquid's coming out of here through the liquid line. All right, your fixed orifice tube on this one right here. This is the one that's going to be kind of like your Bronco out there. It's kind of laid out like this. Okay, so it goes through the evaporator. It comes back out of here. See, I got it green. Comes out of here blue, which is your low pressure. It's still absorbing heat all the way to the compressor. And it'll be cold and sweaty. The compressor squeezes it. The discharge line is right here, going back into there. So the, actually, you've got the... Uh, Evaporator hidden in there. What is that big yellow chamber for after the brush? That? Yeah. That's basically like a muffler. And it also has a tendency to, well, it, it, mostly that's what it is. Some of them will have a filter. In there. I mean, sometimes you may have a, a screen in there, something the, like that. The only thing I've ever seen them on was like a, a Nissan or a Ford. Yeah, you'll see them. I mean, they'll be on several of them, but it'll be like a, it keeps it, this right here is, when it's running, it, it's kind of like a motor. And it's just sort of, think of that as a muffler, so, you know, to keep you from hearing the operation of the compressor. But, I, but that's a good question. All right, you're supposed to remove heat from the enclosed area and also dehumidify the air. Heat's absorbed by the refrigerant and evaporator. This is not, this is something I've already covered. Not going to get crazy on that. All right, so heat transfer. If two substances of different temperature are placed near each other, the heat and warmer substance will always travel to the colder substance until both of equal, equal temperature. How many of you guys have ever heard of the uh, second law of thermodynamics? You heat something up, it's going to cool off, basically. Eventually, everything comes to the same level, right? In other words, everything's going to be the same temperature. Now, what is, why, is things, why is it warmer in one place than it is the other? Because somebody's actually heating it up. In order to heat it up, you have to trade something solid for something, you know, for energy. And you can't get out of the game. That's the only way to make things work. Whenever it gets to the point where you can't transfer, can't transform any more heat, it's all over. No, basically. Of course, it'll be a long time. Okay, a cake of ice in an ice box doesn't communicate its coldness to the bottle of milk. Uh, in obedience to nature's law, the heat in the warm milk automatically flows into the ice, which has a lesser degree of heat. So when a liquid boils, it absorbs heat without raising the temperature of the gas. That's what I was talking about earlier. All right. Place one pound of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit in a container over a flame, and with each British thermal unit of heat the water absorbs from the flame, its temperature rises one degree Fahrenheit. So a British thermal unit is enough heat, the heat required, to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. If I ask you this in the middle of the shop, one of the things I don't like is after I've taught you something like this, if I ask you in the middle of the day, you know, what's a British thermal unit, I don't want to hear, oh no, I don't want to hear that, okay? You're supposed to remember this stuff, right? Okay, latent heat of vaporization, this is what we were talking about earlier. One pound of water will absorb 970 BTUs of heat and changing to a vapor. So you put 970 BTUs, you know, in a, how, much is, how much water is a pound? Yeah, 16 ounces of weight, 16 ounces of fluid. You know, water and uh, I mean, water is the is the standard for weight, both in the metric system and in the uh, and in the imperial system. All right, this is how uh, this heat transfer occurs when a liquid boils or a vapor condenses, forms the basic principle of all conventional refrigeration systems. All right, so for a liquid to be a good refrigerant, 
The amount of heat is absorbed has got to be loaded. I was talking about that earlier. Okay. Place a bottle of milk at room temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, next to boiling water, 212. Heat's going to flow from the higher temperature to the milk. Right? We already talked about that. So we got to choose a liquid with a low boiling point, which is refrigerant 134A. You know, basically now they're coming out with this uh, HF 1230, uh, HYF 1234. I can't even remember all the words, but it's 1234. Uh, right now, the new refrigerant that they're talking about putting in the cars is $100 a pound. Isn't that great? I mean, what I'm saying is 134 is going away. And 1234 is kind of flammable, but so is 134. But 1234 was produced by Honeywell DuPont or whatever. And basically, there's a guy that I know. You know the uh, refrigerant identifier that we have? Yeah. Yeah, the guy, that, the guy whose company builds those is a friend of mine. And uh, he's a smart cookie. And one of the things that he was telling me is, he says, in our testing, we buy these in it's six pound bottles of it. And I think the bottle, the initial bottles that we're buying of it were $3,000 or something for six pounds of it when it was still brand new. Now the price may come down over time, but the simple fact is they're worried about the global warming potential of it. You know, of the new or of the, of the old. And so what they're wanting to do, they don't really like for us to be comfortable. I think they all want us to all be miserable or something. You know, but the simple fact is, oh, and by the way, before you guys leave here, go on the uh, ESCO website, you know, the ESCO Institute, and it costs about $12 to go through that test and get certified to work on air conditioners. Because if you're working on an air conditioner and you don't have ESCO certification, uh, you, you got, uh, it's like a $33,000 fine for the shop. If the EPA guy comes walking in there and you're working on an air conditioner, and says, excuse me, you got your ESCO card? Huh? And he goes to the guy and says, the, the guy says, well, this other guy's ESCO certified. Yeah, I know, but he's not the one doing the work. This guy right here, so $33,000, please, or we'll send you a bill next month. See what I'm saying? You want to protect your employer and yourself? Get ESCO certified. Doesn't cost much, not hard to do, really important. Do that. Everybody needs to do that before you leave here. Okay. Use extreme care to prevent liquid refrigerant from coming in contact with your skin and especially your eyeballs. I know a lot of you guys hate safety glasses with a purple passion, but you need to be wearing them when you're working on air conditioners, batteries, and anything else we're doing out here in the shop. All of your syllabuses say you're supposed to wear safety glasses in the shop, right? All right. Avoid a dangerous explosion. Don't weld. Use a torch, sorter, steam, clean, break body finishes. On the or immediate area of any part of the refrigerant system because it can actually cause an issue. I haven't seen this, but it is the p potential thing that can happen. Uh, primarily because I haven't been the person that wanted to hold a torch over there on the AC system. What happens if you burn a hole in that on that little tube? You know what I'm saying. And furthermore, since it's a little bit flammable, if you happen to have a flame there, suddenly wherever you breach that tube becomes a torch. Right. Yeah. We have had torch to air condition on in here. Yeah, that was not with refrigerant in it though, Dodo. <laughs> okay, that was an empty line after the stuff was already gone out of it. That was the one that you were beating on with the hammer trying to get the thing off. <laughs> and we were we already had taken the refrigerant out of it. I mean, you can actually heat it up if there's nothing in it. But you know, if you're not working on the AC, you know, and you happen to burn a hole in that line, it's going to cause a fire. You can burn a whole car down the ground. If you ain't real slick about that. You know, you know how easy it is to burn a hole in a piece of aluminum with a torch. Alright. Right after disconnecting the component from the system, see if it's ready to install. Now if you've got a new compressor that you're putting on one, make double sure that you take that compressor out of the box and any paper that's in the box with that compressor, you need to pull it out of there and read it. Because the compressor, it'll either say it's shipped without oil and you need to put oil in it, or it'll say it's already got oil in it, so don't add any oil. But what you're also supposed to do when you take a new compressor out of the box is stand it on his nose. Stand it on his nose so that oil can all that seal around the front. You know, a lot of times people just take the compressor and pop it on there like you want a water pump or something. You're basically supposed to be really careful when you do an AC work if you don't want a problem to help tell you something else too. If you happen to pull the refrigerant out of one, the only way you can tell how much refrigerant is actually supposed to be in one, in other words, if you think if one's not cooling. You can pull the refrigerant out, see how much you pull out, put back the right amount. That's the way you're supposed to do it. In cold weather like we got here, 
if you pull the refrigerant out of that thing, if you tell the, the machine will tell you it's done, you walk away and leave it hooked up in a, in a 50 degree weather or something, you know, you're going to come back and it's going to come back up. You're not going to get it all out of there with one pull, typically, because it's going to outgas from, it's in this oil that's in the accumulator, kind of like the gas in a Dr. Pepper. See what I mean? So basically, it's going to bubble some more out of there, and you can actually wind up putting too much refrigerant in there if you don't make darn sure you got it all out. You may have to do your recovery process, you know, go find you a cup of coffee, come back, do it again, go find you a cup of coffee, come back, do it again. I once pulled two pounds of refrigerant out of one and a quarter pound system that way because it just kept coming out of the refrigerant hole. So make sure you got it all out. Um, Anyway, if you keep pulling it out, every time you pull the refrigerant out, a little oil comes with it. And I have seen those situations where a dealership would keep pulling the refrigerant out of one that had a slow leak and then putting the right amount back in there. And they kept doing that without adding oil until they ran it out of oil and they burned up the compressor. So don't go there either. You know, you got to kind of know what's going on here. I got a lot of stories I can tell you about air conditioning. Okay, refrigerant oil will absorb moisture from the atmosphere. <clears throat> tell you something else about refrigerant oil. It's really poisonous. Don't get your hands in refrigerant oil if you can help it because it's, it's, it's not like motor oil. Refrigerant oil is really poisonous. We do not pour refrigerant oil in there with the waste oil. I got a special thing back here we pour waste refrigerant oil in. We try to keep it out of there. All right. All right, before connecting an open fitting, always install a new seal ring. Coat the fitting and seal with refrigerant oil before connecting. And when you're installing a refrigerant line, don't bend it really sharp. Okay, position it away from exhaust or any sharp edges. Tighten the fittings only to specified torque, don't over tighten. And when you're disconnecting a fitting, use a wrench on both parts of the fitting to prevent twisting or refrigerant lines or tubes. If you're working on a Chevrolet pickup and you're having to put the, one of them older ones like early 90s, and you're having to put an orifice tube in it, usually those lines, when you when come apart, they'll take the threads with them. You've got to put a condenser and a liquid line on them. And uh, since it's about lunchtime, we're going to stop there today.